it's it's set. That's the testimony. You can't amend it afterward. Now what happens? Now the question becomes: What happens if I? What happens if I sign a document? So the document now is also like testimony. We said regarding monetary law, a document is like testimony. So once the document has been signed, in some sense, the testimony has been entered and the question becomes, could it be qualified later, right? So if we have a document that says that somebody owes me money and two people sign, they later show up to court and say, oh yes, it says that, that uh, someone owes him money, but it's only on a certain condition and the condition has not been met. So in that sense, they want to amend and they want to qualify the document. And in some sense, what they want to do is, is get nullifying the doc document. The document is, does not have the power to, to, uh, co to, to help the, the, the creditor collect. So that was the question last week. And the answer was last week, we had a lot of uh, some interruptions with the weather and with the children, but the answer last week was based on a, a Talmudic principle, which states that the mouth that prohibits is also the mouth that permits. In other words, if I am the one who establishes something, then I ha you have to believe me when I qualify that. And the example we brought is that if I'm the one who says, if somebody shows up and says, I'm married, but I was divorced, and we don't have any other external information telling us that she's married, it's only based on her testimony alone, then, even though typically if someone says I'm divorced, we say you have to prove it, where's the bill of divorce? But if somebody is not, well, we, if we don't know that they were married and they were the ones who established that they were married, so then we have to trust them when they say they were divorced. How do you apply that to this case? To this case, it's similar. If we could, if we could, um, if we could establish the documents without the witnesses, authenticate the document without the witnesses, then the witnesses cannot qualify it. But if we cannot authenticate the document without these witnesses, then they could qualify it. And the example to explain what that means, we said last week already, we said that um, how do you qualify, how do you, how do you authenticate a document? If somebody brings a document, how do you know that it's true? So there are several ways which we'll, with Maimonides discusses later. But for the purpose of our discussion, we have to two people. We have to get testimony that these that the signature of these people is an, indeed an authentic signature. So if I have a document and I have two people sign it, we have to then prove that those signatures belongs to those people. How do you prove that? Well, sometimes other people can testify. If other people testify, then the the people who signed are not, cannot qualify the documents because we don't need them to authenticate the documents. But if we do need them to authenticate the document because nobody else recognizes their signature, so only the people who sign the document show up and say, this is our signature and therefore it's a true document, in that case, because you need their words to authenticate the document, you have to trust them when they qualify it and when they say that there is, um, there is a condition. That's what we discussed last week. So if anybody wants to ask a question on that, wonderful. Otherwise, we will continue and add some, some details into the mix here. Okay, what happens? We're going a little off topic, we're gonna to come back. What happens if you see, we live in the United States of America. I guess this is not so common, but I guess in, in, in the past or in other places in the world, this is more common than we'd like to think. So what happens if somebody comes to, to my house and he is a very powerful person? I don't know, maybe he's connected to, to, to organized crime. Maybe he's just a bully. And he tells me, I like your house. I say, good, I like the house too. He says, I want to buy your house. He says, he says he wants to buy my house. I say it's not for sale. But how, because, of his, he, because of his power, he forces me to sell. 
So he'll give me the value of the house, he'll write me a check, and he'll force me to sell the house. So in Talmudic language, it's called an alam. Some people were just powerful people. Alam is a strong, is a strong person, a strong, a strong, strong hand. And this person is so powerful, and for whatever reason, he can force, I'm afraid of him. So he gives me the check and he wants me to sell in the house. And I have no choice, so I'm afraid. So I, so I want to sign the document. So the question is, what, what happens with this document? What happens with this document? Is this sale indeed a valid sale? So there's a fascinating, without getting into too, much, too, much, too many details, Fascinating law. This is actually an interesting law. This is a little bit of place with psychology a little bit. So the, the standard case is as follows. Someone comes to me at, gun, at, gun point, at gunpoint and says, sell your house. So I decide to sell. I have no choice. I sell my house. They give me the money, right? Then later I show up to court. I guess later the law and order is established in the region. So I show up to court and I say I was forced to buy I was forced to sell. So I want to invalidate the sale because I was forced to sell. That's an interesting question. Could you invalidate the sale because you were forced to sell? So the Talmud has a very interesting um, insight. I don't know if you're going to agree with it. I don't know. I suspect you won't, but it's an interesting insight. Says the Talmud, you can't invalidate a sale because you were forced to sell. You know why? Because every time you sell, you're forced to sell. Why do you sell? Who would in their right mind sell any real estate? The only reason why you sell is because you have no choice. You need cash or whatever the case is. So you're always, you're always forced to sell. Yet, because you're getting paid, therefore you agree, therefore you accept the, the coercion and you agree to relinquish their ownership rights. So what's the difference if I sell because I'm coerced because I have no money in the bank? or I'm coerced because somebody else is forcing me. That's what the Talmud says. I don't, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if you'll love this answer, but that's what the Talmud says. However, the Talmud says there is, a, there is a protection. What's the protection? So if the bully wants me to sign, want, wants to force me to sell the house, I could do what's called a moda'a. Moda'a is a declaration. And here's what, here's what I do. I call two witnesses. It could be other witnesses or the same witnesses, it doesn't matter. I take them to the side and I say, I'm making a declaration. The declaration I'm saying is as follows. The sale that I'm about to perform is against my will. That's all you have to do. And the moment you perform that declaration, then in the future, decades later, centuries later, it doesn't matter. In the future, you can come back and you could undo the bill of sale. How do you undo the bill of sale? You prove, you, you bring the witnesses that say that you were coerced and you made, a, you made a declaration. And the declaration stated that you don't want to sell. Now, what happens if you evoke this declaration? So I get my house back, and I have to give back the million dollars that the bully paid me. That's the law of moda'a. Moda'a means declaration. So now the question becomes as follows. What happens if there's a document and there's no way to authenticate the document, but two witnesses show up and say, this is our handwriting. So they are the ones who authenticate the document. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What happens if there's a document that says I sold my house? And the document could be authenticated. Everybody can recognize the signatures and the document is authenticated. Now, the two witnesses that show up that's two witnesses that signed on the document show up and they say, they don't say there was a condition. If there was a condition, we're not going to trust them in this case. If you remember, in this case, we won't trust them if they qualify it with the condition. Why won't we trust them if they qualify it with the condition? Because we don't need their testimony because the document was authenticated anyway. So in this case, that they don't say there was a condition. In this case, they say, that this was a forced sale. Indeed, it's a good document, everything is fine, we signed it, but the owner was forced to sell, and the owner made a declaration. We are the people, we are the two witnesses who signed on this document. The owner told us that he's forced to sell, 
And because the owner told us he forced to sell, then this document is problematic. So that's the case. That's the case that Maimonides is addressing right now. And this is a very interesting distinction. Based on everything we learned last week and re reiterated today, I would expect the law to be that we don't trust the witness. We don't trust the witnesses that say that it was a coerced sale. Why not? Let's follow the logic. The logic is if the document um, is authenticated without, not by the testimony of the witnesses who signed it, but it's authenticated externally. Everybody knows that this is a good document because everybody recognizes the signature, the, the handwriting of the, of the people who signed. So we said that if the document could be authenticated without the witnesses, that we don't trust the witnesses to make any changes. That's what I would expect. That's the law about a condition. Says Maimonides, that's true about a condition, but it's not true about a moda'a, about a declaration. So in this case, if they come and they say that this is indeed an authentic document, but we were, we were, um, the owner was forced to sell, in that case, we believe them, even if the document could be authenticated without their testimony. Question, of course, is why? And this is where you have to put on your Talmudic cap, and you have to think about, this is what you do in law school, and this is what you do in the Talmud. You have to differentiate between cases. And this is, what it, and this is the logic here. Here it goes. The logic is as follows. The logic is, when the witnesses say that this is a good document, but there was a condition, the condition nullifies the document, right? The document says, I owe you $100. The condition says, I only owe you $100 in certain cases and those cases, and, and, and that, under, under certain conditions, and those conditions have not been yet met. So bottom line, the reality is that the witnesses who want to qualify the document with a condition, they are nullifying the documents. What happens in the case when the witnesses show up and they want to qualify the document by saying it was a forced document? In other words, it's a moda, they're making the declaration that the guy was forced to sell. Here, says Maimonides, and this is a fascinating idea, here, the witnesses must be believed. Why do they have to be believed? Because they are not nullifying the document. They're not saying that the document is not true. The document is still in force even after their declaration that, was a, that it was a core sale. How so? How is the document still, still in effect? We're going to nullify the sale. The home is going to go back to the original owner. So the answer, says Maimonides, Maimonides doesn't say it, but Maimonides just rules. But the logic is, the logic is, of course, the owner, the original owner, the seller gets his home back but the buyer gets his million dollars back. In other words, this document still serves a function. What does this document serve? This document serves to tell you how much the bully paid the homeowner, right? So when these witnesses come and they say, this document has been, um, is, is, is testifying to a forced sale, they're not saying tear up the document, the document is worthless. To the contrary, the document is valuable because even if the document comes back to, even if we believe that it was indeed a, a, a coerced sale and the home has to go back to the original homeowner, well, then the homeowner has to, bully, has to reimburse the bully for the amount that's written in the documents. So the document is still valuable. So in that case, the witnesses are not undoing the, the document and therefore the witnesses will be believed. That is the, the law that we're going to read inside. It's a little bit complicated. It's a line and a half in Maimonides. We'll, re we'll read it inside. We'll see if anybody has any questions. I already see a question coming in, so let me see if I can pick it up. And then we'll get to, <clears throat> then we'll <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, and then maybe we'll move to the next topic. Okay, Rabbi, let's see. Rabbi, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, what, what if the, um, the, the, the owner, the forced owner, um, is, tells uh, the witnesses a lie? that um, I was forced and this is what it cost. And so now they are witness to that because I have told them that. So in good faith, they appear, but the original information they got was not right. That's a good question. The question that the question, the, the question depend, the question really is, to state your question in other words, is do the witnesses who testify about the declaration, meaning 
when, when they testify and they say the owner told us that, the, that, that it was coerced, do they, do they have to know about the coercion or they trust the seller? That's the right. question. Yes. The answer to your question, of course, is that it is addressed, but I don't remember. So if you give me a few seconds, I'll find it in the book of Maimonides. Um, let me check it up. Give me just a minute. I'll grab the book. I apologize. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Okay, let's see if I can find this. Jill, the answer to your question is the witnesses have to. <clears throat> the answer to your question is, Jill, the witnesses have to know that that it was coercion. They can't just trust the seller. They have to have firsthand knowledge. And Maimonides, I'll just read Maimonides. He says, he says, um, the witnesses have to know that the person is selling because of because he's coerced. In other words, they have to have firsthand knowledge. And they, can, they don't rely on what he says. They have to know that. And he says, any written document, that, any written declaration that does not say, we, the witnesses, know that the owner was coerced is not considered a declaration. In other words, it doesn't have that power to undo the sale. So that's Thank the answer, you. That's the answer yeah. to your question. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, the good news is that I didn't have to guess because my Maimonides addresses that explicitly. Okay, there's a question here. Let me see if I can pull it up and then. What, is, what if the document states the seller entered into the transaction freely and without coercion? Um, the answer to that question is, in other words, the document of sale says that, that the seller is selling it freely and without coercion. The answer is it doesn't matter. It's still overridden by the previous statement of the uh, by, by, the, by the declaration, because just like the bully can force me to sell, to sell, the bully can also force me to write that it was of my free will. So the original, the document of sale, even if it says that it was, that it was of my free will, we don't trust that provided there was a, provided there was a moida, provided there was a declaration made. I think it's a fascinating distinction, a fascinating concept is, the, the, in other words, it's actually more interesting is the law, if you did not make a declaration, the sale is valid even if you were forced to sell. Why? Because if I, when I get the money, somehow or another, because I got the full value of the house, when I get the money, somehow or another, I agree to sell. And like the Talmud says, every case of sale is, is, is coercion. In other words, I never want to sell, but the money makes me agree. So that, I think that's more radical. But the bottom line is, if, even if the document of, set, of sale, set, even if the bill of sale says, says, says that the seller is, sent, is selling it by their own free will, if you wrote a declaration, that, that, will, that, will, that will nullify the bill of sale. What happens if the buyer has sold or given the property to a third person? If the buyer has sold, it will go back. And basically, the, the buyers will be, will, will be, will, will be reimbursed. So in other words, if, I, if, you sell me a, if you sell me land that is mortgaged to somebody else, right? So the end of the day is the unsuspecting buyer, the, th the second buyer has to return it. And then he goes back to the seller and tries to collect from the seller if he can. But it doesn't matter if he sold it either way. Um, either way, the land will always go back to its original owner. And then if anybody cheated anybody along the way, they'll have to be reimbursed by the person who cheated them, who defrauded them. If you can collect, if you can't collect, I'm sorry, what can I do? Next time, buy title insurance. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know if they had title insurance then, but that's what you should do. Yes. Rabbi, uh, in which form the declaration is made? Is it also in the form of document or just a, um, just a statement? It could be done by a document. If, it's, if, if there's no document, if the witnesses show up in person, is even better. But it could even do. It could even be done by the, by, a, by a document. So that's the document issued at the time of the original. They don't issue. They, 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 no. What they do is, if, if I'm being forced to sell, the bully comes up to me and says, "We're going to sell. We're selling this afternoon." So in the morning, 
I find two witnesses, either the same people that are going to sign on the bill of sale or other people, it doesn't matter. And I say, listen, here I'm telling you that I'm forced to sell. And then when it, when I, when it, when I, if I can get back to court or if there's ever be some cases, if there'll ever be a, a position of law and order, I will go back to court and I'm going to demand my house back and I'm going to give the bully the, the million dollars back. So in that case, in that case, if I said it to, if I said it to those witnesses, now those witnesses can write it down. If I write it down, then I have proof. If they don't write it down, then I'm going to have to schlep those two to court. So I would rather them write it down, unless they're afraid to write it down because the NSA is watching. So then, then, then they'll, then they can, then, then they don't have to write it down, but eventually they'll have to come to court to testify. So this is, you see the problem, it's not a problem. The thing is, in every law, every law here brings up another whole, it's all interconnected. So we're really law, l l reading about the laws of, could a witness modify the document after, it's, after it was signed? And now we're getting into the laws of writing the declaration for a for sale. But you see what's happening here is everything is intertwined because you have to think about all the scenarios. And again, the big idea that Maimonides is saying is that when those witnesses show up and say that this document was a core sale, they're gonna be believed. Why are they believed? Because typically the law is witnesses cannot nullify the document. But here, they're not nullifying the document. The document is still very much in play. The document still serves a function. What's the function that the document serves? The document tells me how much the original homeowner who has been bullied, how much he has to pay the bully. He'll get his house back, but, but, he, ha but, but he has to pay the bully that, that million dollars that are written in the documents. So in that sense, the document is, is a valid document doing exactly, what it's, doing exactly what it states. It states that there was a million dollar transaction. And the witnesses are not nullifying that when they come and they say that there was a coercion. And therefore, says Maimonides, we do believe them because they're not undermining the documents. Contrast that with the case where the document says, I owe you a million dollars. And they and the witnesses show, show up and say, well, there was a condition and the condition has not been met. So bottom line, they're nullifying the document because they're saying, I don't have to give you a million dollars. So they're nullifying the documents. So therefore, so therefore, in the, in the, in the case of the, of the condition, we don't trust the witnesses. But in the case of the witnesses coming and saying, they don't say there was a condition, but they would say that, that there, was manipul there was coercion, then we will believe them. That is the law. That is the law that we left off. Number, number eight, like I said, everything I just told you in the last 20 minutes is one and a half lines in Maimonides because his job is to be brief. That's what he set out to do, and that's why he did so. Rabbi, what is yeah. the uh, assumption underlying this law and all the other laws um, that it's based on? So there, there are a few assumptions. Number, assumption number one is once witnesses testify, they go home, they can't come back tomorrow and amend the testimony. If, me, if, if, if two witnesses show up and say, a trans, and, and say testimony, and they were cross-examined, says the Talmud, once they were cross-examined, and once their witness has, their testimony has been established, they're done, that's it, it's finished. They can't undo it. Because who knows, they may be subject to pressures, they may be subject to other manipulations. So once the testimony has been established, you can't retract it. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two, a document is just like testimony. Not biblically speaking, but from the perspective of the rabbis, a document is just like testimony. And therefore, the standard case should be that once a document is signed and authenticated, authenticated means that later witnesses showed up and said, yes, this is an authentic document because we recognize the signatures of the, of the witnesses. So once the document has been authenticated, so it has been entered into court, so it's just like the witnesses already made their testimony. And we know principle number one tells you that once witnesses testify, they can amend their testimony. So principle two tells you that on the most cases, once the document has been entered, in other words, once the document exists, even the witnesses who signed the document cannot add anything because the document has the same power as testimony. And if the witnesses who testified can change what they're saying, so the document can e cannot either be changed. That's the second principle. Now that we have a second principle, we have a list of a list of exceptions 
because it's not so simple that a document is really testimony, that is that it's only rabbinic. So there are exceptions. And this is one of the exceptions. But the main principle, it's all, if you want to go back, drill down, what is the underlying value that we're trying to promote here is that once somebody testifies, they can't come back tomorrow and say, oh no, I meant something else. It wasn't here, it was there. Once you testify, testimony has been entered, you have been cross-examined, it's done. It's already out of your power. You can't, the witness, the witness is not trustworthy to show up a year later and say, oh, I lied. We don't trust you. In other words, you said it already. Once you said it, you can't change it. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay, now that, we, with your permission, I'm gonna go to one more law in this chapter, and then we'll move to a new subject, also within, within witnesses. Uh, if anybody's tired of reading about witnesses, send me a text afterward, because otherwise we can go for many, many months. But I want, because we're talking about a bully, I'm gonna say one more case about a bully. It's not exactly directly related, but it's uh, in this chapter, so it's related. So I guess the subject of tonight is, what do we, how do we, of today, this morning, how do we deal with the bullies? So number one principle in the Torah, in, in, in the Torah system of law, not number one, a very important principle of the Torah, and it's also an American law and most systems of law, is that, is that what the Talmud, the Talmud refers to it as hamaytzi mechaveda olavaraya, if I want to extract money from you, if I'm the plaintiff, if I want to take money out of your possession, uh, the burden of proof is upon me. In other words, the burden of proof is not, a, is not, a, is not upon the, defend, the, the person defending, the burden of proof is upon the plaintiff. Maybe the lawyers here will send me the, the exact formulation of this principle in English. But in Hebrew, in Talmudic language, it's hamaytzi mechaveda alavaraya, if I want to claim something from somebody else, the burden of proof is upon me. There's one exception to that. The exception to that is if I am a known bully, everybody knows that I'm a bully. I manipulate people, I scare people, people are afraid of me. Then I show up and I make a claim. I'm sorry. I'm the bully. Somebody comes to town, somebody comes to court and says, Mr. Bully, Menachem Feldman, Mr. Bully owes him $100. So they tell the witnesses, so they tell the bully, I'm sorry, they tell the plaintiff, bring witnesses. So the bully says, I'm sorry, so the plaintiff says, I can't bring witnesses. They say, why not? They say, nobody's gonna come testify against the bully. I have witnesses, but they're afraid to come. Okay, so that's an interesting case, right? So the case is, again, the scenario is, I am the, I am the defendant, but I'm a bully. And the plaintiff says that he can't bring witnesses to support his claim. Why can't he bring witnesses to support his claim? Because the witnesses are afraid of the bully. And because it's the morning, I'm gonna tell you a story because this is a Talmudic story. It's actually a funny story. <laughs> this is a funny story. In short, I'll tell you the answer first. In short, the answer would be, in this case, we make an exception and we flip. And we say, in this case, you ready? The defendant, the bully, has to prove that he does not owe money, which is very strange. Typically, the plaintiff has to prove, typically, the plaintiff has to prove that he's owed money. And if the plaintiff can't, can't prove that he's owed money, then the defendant does not have to prove anything, right? The burden of proof is upon the plaintiff. In this case, because the defendant is a bully, the defendant will have to defend himself. And if he cannot prove that he doesn't owe the money, he would have to pay the money, which is very strange because it's, it's not strange. It's, 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 it's out of the ordinary. And the, it's out of the ordinary. Of course, the lesson is don't be a bully. <clears throat> in other words, we discussed this before. We discussed this that in the Torah system, a person's credibility and a person trust, a person's trustworthiness is, is, is very powerful. And therefore, one of the reasons that, that a person would actually won't, wouldn't lie in court is because if he does, he ruins his, not only his reputation, but his legal credibility. And in some cases, protections that the average citizen has under the law will not apply to somebody who's a known, who's a known, a known thief or a known liar we're a proven liar because a lot of this, the Torah system is predicated upon the average citizen being an upstanding citizen. I know it's, it's sometimes surprising to assume that it's a positive outlook to assume that the average guy who walks into court is upstanding, but that's the way the Torah works. We, we suppose the average guy is saying the truth and therefore we give him a certain amount of protection. 
But if we know that this person is a known thief, in other words, he stole, we have proof that he stole, or we have proof that he lied, etc., then a lot of the protections that the Torah gives to an average person are suspended from this person because, because like we said, because um, we can't trust them. So here's a funny story. I'm just turning the pages here to get to it. Here's a funny story. Okay, there was a once a story with a, a gentleman named Mari Bar Isak, or his name was Hana Bar Isak. We're not sure. I guess it was a whole family of bullies. In other words, very powerful people. I'm not saying bully. They were very powerful people. People were afraid of them. They had a very powerful position in the community. So this family, this, the father's name was Isak. He had two sons, apparently, Mari or Hana, whatever the case is, it happened to one of the brothers. So they're living in Babylonia, living... living um, living a good life. Their father was a wealthy man. He passed away, so they inherited the father's land. Now, here's what happened. They've inherited the father's estate. Here's what happened. Um, all of a sudden, somebody shows up from a town called Chuzaa. Chuzaa was another city in Babylonia. Someone shows up from, um, from Chuzaa, which was sort of a distant city, and he says, tells this gentleman, this wealthy gentleman, he says, I'm your brother. He says, what do you mean I'm your brother? He says, I'm your brother. So, okay, mazel tov. I'm happy you're my brother. So he says, I want half your father's estate. Ah, you want half my father's estate. Okay, how do you know you're my brother? You're not my brother. You have to prove you're my brother, right? So that person claims that the father, Isaac, traveled to the other city that was distant, Chuzaa, married another woman, had another son. The brothers back home did not know about it. And um, the brothers back home didn't know about it. So he says, I'm your father's son, I'm your brother, and therefore I'm not here to just come to celebrate your birthday party, but please hand over half of the estate. Okay, that's a big claim. So <clears throat> what did this guy say, Mari Barisak? He says, I don't know who you are. I have no idea who you are. You're a stranger. What do you want half my estate? You claim you're my brother. I don't know who you are. He denied the whole story. He has no idea. Maybe, maybe he had no idea. Did my father marry someone else? I had no idea. So they go to court. They come before the, 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 the court. The court is Rav Chista. Rav Chista was the, was the rabbi of the city. So Rav Chista says, You know something? This stranger has a point. Why does this stranger have a point? So Rav Chizda evokes the biblical story. What happened with the biblical story? The biblical story was that the biblical story is with Joseph and his brothers. So obviously, we know the story. Most people know the story. Joseph was kidnapped by his brothers, sold as a slave, and eventually becomes the leader of Egypt, the second in command of Egypt. Years later, the brothers come before Joseph, and Joseph accuses them to buy bread because there was a famine. And Joseph accuses them of being spies. So the verse says that Joseph recognized them, yet, he, yet, yet they did not recognize Joseph. So why, or how did that happen? How come the king, how come Joseph recognizes his 10 brothers, but the 10 brothers don't recognize him? So the answer is because Joseph was young when, he, when the brothers sold him. So now as an adult, he looked different than when he was young. So the brothers did not recognize him. However, the brothers were all grown when they sold Joseph. So once you're all grown, you're 30 years old, 40 years old, you look alike. And therefore, Joseph could not recognize them. But I'm sorry, they cannot recognize Joseph, who was a child when, when they departed. But Joseph could recognize them because they were adults when they, when, when they sold Joseph. So Rav tells this, tell, tells this man, Mari Bar Isak, he says, look, this person's claim is, I'm sorry, I'm going to amend this story. I made a mistake. The person's claim is that he was young. He actually lived it. He was young, and then the father took him to another, another city, and he was raised in another city. But his claim was that he departed from, um, from you when he was a child. Now you say you don't know who that person is. 
Of course you don't know. Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him either because he was grown up. But now this person is grown up. He left, he left you when he was a child. You say you don't recognize him, but he may still be your brother. So we have biblical precedent to the fact that an older brother won't recognize a younger brother if, the, if they departed when the younger brother was a child, and then the younger brother grows, grows up. So I think I made a mistake. It wasn't that he says, the claim was that I, I was born amongst you, my father took me to another city, raised me there, and I'm that other brother. So the older brother says, I have no idea who you are, I don't recognize you. So Rav Chista says, just because you don't recognize him, it doesn't mean it's not him. Because Joseph's brothers did not recognize Joseph either. So Talmud continues. Rav Chizda, the rabbi, told this wealthy, established, a, a powerful person in town, he says, go bring... I'm sorry. He told the, the, the plaintiff, he told the child that showed up, he told the stranger that showed up, he says, go bring proof that you are the brother. Right? You're the plaintiff. You claim you're the brother. You want half the estate. So go bring proof that you're the brother. So the person says, I can't bring proof. Why can't I bring proof? Nobody is going to come and testify against E.C. Mori Barisak. This person is a prominent person in town. He's too powerful. Nobody's going to testify against him. And because no one's going to testify against him, I can't bring proof that I am their brother because my witnesses are afraid to show up. So, so what did Mari Barisak do? So what did the rabbi say? Rabbi said, um, the, the, so the rabbi turns to the, to the, to the estab powerful established person in town and he says, okay, so you bring proof that the stranger is not your brother. In other words, the obligation now flips. Instead of the plaintiff having to bring proof, now the defendant, the brother, the wealthy, the wealthy individual, the powerful individual has to bring proof that this stranger who showed up from another town is not his brother. That's very strange. That goes against the, the normal system where the plaintiff has to bring the proof. So Mori Bar Isak tells the rabbi, he says, that's the law? Chidina Hachi, is that the law? The law is that someone shows up and says, he's my brother. I have to prove that he's not my brother? No, he should have to prove that he is my brother. Um, so Abchista says, yes, that's the law for you and for all other powerful people. In other words, in other words, um, the powerful people, if, you're, if, you, if your people are afraid of you, and therefore we assume no one's going to testify against you, then the burden of proof switches, and you have to defend yourself against the other claim. Then there's a typical question. If everybody's afraid of Mari Barisak, so Mari Barisak will go and, 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 and force people to testify that they know that that guy is not their brother. So the Talmud says, no, people are afraid of the bully, they're going to stay home and be quiet. But they're not afraid to the extent that they're going to show up and lie in court. We're not worried about that. So that's the story in the Talmud, codified by Maimonides in chapter 3 of the Laws of Witnesses that we have, uh, that, that it's, it's in the link. I'm just going to read it. Um, number 12, the last section of chapter 3. That will be, that will be it for this, for this topic. So the last section of, of, of chapter 3, number 12. Whenever a plaintiff has witnesses who will testify to prove his claim, he must tend to the witnesses until he brings them to court. The language is a little bit tricky here. The commentaries of Maimonides say, what Maimonides is saying is that you, the plaintiff, have to bring the witnesses to court, meaning to say you have to prove your case. If the court knows that the defendant is a strong and stubborn person, and the plaintiff claims that the witnesses are afraid to come and testify on behalf of the plaintiff, Right? It's not that I say you're a bully. Everybody knows you have that reputation. Everybody's afraid of you. And the defendant says, I have witnesses, but my witnesses are afraid to show up. The court compels the defendant to bring the witnesses. And again, the commentaries of Maimonides explain that what that means is that now the burden of proof is upon the, the defendant. In other words, the strong, per strong and stubborn defendant has to prove that he does not owe. We adjudicate cases involving strong and stubborn people according to these and other analogous principles. So I know this may make people uncomfortable because we like to think of law as the law has to be equal and the law has to trust, treat everybody equal. But of course, there are exceptions to that rule and some people who harm their own credibility, then if they have to make a claim, they're going to have to work harder to establish their credibility. In this case, 
if you are known to be to using your power, not that you're a powerful person, but you're using your power, you're known to use your power in bad ways, then if somebody's gonna make a claim against you, you're opening yourself up that you are gonna to have to defend yourself much more vigorously than other people because other people have a certain basic assumption of, uh, of tr trustworthiness and therefore the, the burden of proof is upon the claimant, upon the plaintiff. But if the defendant is a stubborn, bully, strong person, and the plaintiff claim and the plaintiff claims that he has witnesses, but the witnesses are afraid to show up and testify against him, um, then the burden of proof switches to the defendant. The bully has to prove that he does not owe the money. So that's two of the two, two, two little points that we touched upon today. We spent 42 minutes, so the, our time is running out. Next week, we will continue um, a different chapter, but also within the co concept of witnesses. If today was a little detailed, next week will be more general. The way Maimonides works is in every chapter, the, the big point, the big idea is the beginning, and that's the big idea. That's what we discussed last week. And then as the chapter mo moves forward, you get more and more details and examples and cases and exceptions, and then it becomes a little bit more detailed, a little bit harder to follow. So in any case, I hope you enjoyed. I hope this got you thinking a little bit, either made you ha happy or unhappy, as long as you're not indifferent. If you're indifferent, it's a problem. But if the laws, if the, if the, if the logic either made you happy or unhappy, then, then it was a good day. In any case, have a wonderful day. I hope everybody is well. The plan is, the plan is to do a class tomorrow on Song of Songs chapter two. Unfortunately, I may have to postpone it because depending on um, one of our children has a, a little procedure tomorrow scheduled and we don't know yet what time it's going to be. So I may have to postpone it, but I'll send out an email by tonight, God willing. And either way, hope to see you sometime soon in good health and have a wonderful day. Thank Anybody you. Anybody want Rebecca. to ask or make Thank a comment? Thank you.